Mr. Secretary General of IPU, Excellencies, Ambassadors, and Representatives of Governments and International Organization, President and Executive Director of Globetics, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2024 Global Ethics Forum. It's my honor today to open this session, the music, the values of Sorgal Misei will accompany us in this afternoon's discussions. Globetics promotes, as you know, ethical leadership for a just, inclusive, and sustainable world. We are going to hear speakers, experts on topics about peace, sustainability, digital revolution, higher education, for the perspective of ethical leadership for a better future for all. <laughs> To open this session, I'm pleased to give the floor to Professor Fatih Daou, Executive Director of Globetics, laureate of the Elevate Prize, Prize for Global Thinkers and Change Makers, and author, author of Political Humanism. Please, Mr. Fatih Daou. Usually, usually this is a bad sign when uh, you have a glass of water, this means that you will speak for a long period of time. <laughs> but I assure you it won't be too long. Excellency Mr. Martin Chung Kong, Secretary General of the Interparliamentary Union, Excellency Ambassador, Excellency Ambassador Tovar da Silva Nunes, permanent representative of Brazil, incumbent G20 presidency. Excellency Ambassador Julian Tony, permanent representative of Switzerland to the Conference on Disarmament. Excellencies, representative of governments, intergovernmental organizations, private sector, civil society, and academic institutions. Dear partners and speakers, dear presidents, international board members and team of Globe Ethics, ladies and gentlemen. Globe Ethics was born in 2004 in the midst of the internet and social media revolution, inspired by the first world summit on the information society with us in Geneva in 2003, addressing the role of governments and all stakeholders in the promotion of ICTs for development. Therefore, the DNA of Globe Ethics is to combine innovation and development and to ensure that both realities are thought, designed, and implemented in an ethical and responsible way, leading for a more just, inclusive, and sustainable world. For this purpose, the Global Ethics Forum, GES, was launched in 2009 as a global, multi-sectoral, and multi-stakeholder solution-oriented platform for dialogue, networking, and engagement, convening policymakers, senior experts, and practitioners from governments, multilateral and non-governmental organizations, private sector, sector and civil society, with educational and faith-based organizations, among others. The forum is an open framework for value-driven value inspiration, exchange, reflection, networking and action, coping with the current global agenda and related ethical challenges and solutions. Through in-depth discussions, shared experiences, case studies, and evidence-based documentation and policy recommendations, the Global Ethics Forum generates innovative ideas, groundbreaking initiatives, and impactful coalitions to put ethical leadership at the heart of the global and sectoral governance. 20 years after the creation of Globe Ethics, we are witnessing nowadays a new turning point in the hand, uh, humankind history. Some have called this moment the fourth industrial revolution. We may be at the beginning of a new civilizational era that is fundamentally changing the way we live, we work, and we relate to each other. But there are more than the changes introduced by artificial intelligence 
and related unprecedented technological advancements that pour our world in a pivotal moment. The environmental and security challenges constitute more than ever a real sword of Damocles over our necks. When I asked my colleagues what I shall say in my opening speech, I was told that we are suffering from the over-politicization and polarization, and I would add militarization of everything. And we should tackle this. We need the courage, I was told, that is essential to ethical leadership, to say the truth while staying inclusive and open to the diversities of opinion, culture, and experiences. Indeed, at a time of celebration of 75th anniversary of Geneva Conventions, the dramatic deterioration of the global stability and human security is shocking and alarming. We have the ethical obligation to say the truth and stay able to make peace. The cost that civilians are paying is at a dangerous scale in Gaza, Israel, Ukraine, Russia, Sudan, and in so many other places across the world. We have been recently reminded at the World Humanitarian Day that already, and maybe more now, 209 UN humanitarian employees were killed in Gaza, which represents the highest number of UN victims in, in conflict since the creation of the United Nations. When the boundaries set by international law to safeguard lives in times of conflict and wars are being so dangerously denigrated, it means that we are heading in a wrong and dangerous direction. However, there is still courage to face this dangerous impunity, which I see emerging within the global public opinion, especially through youth mobilizations, but also on the institutional level, for example, when the judges of the International Court of Justice assume their role of guardians of the international law and the human sanity. The latest draft of the Pact for the Future, which will be endorsed and launched in New York in three weeks from now by the UN Summit of the Future, states that, and I quote, we are at a time of profound global transformation. We are confronted by rising catastrophic and existential risks many caused by the choices we make. Fellow human beings are enduring terrible suffering. If we do not change course, we risk tipping into a future of persistent crisis and breakdown." End of quote. Yet, with this alarming quote, call, the pact ensures that this can also be, and I quote again the pact, a moment of hope and opportunity. Global transformation is a chance for renewal and progress grounded in our common humanity. Advances in knowledge, science, technology, and innovation could deliver a breakthrough to a better and more sustainable future for all. The choice, the pact says, the choice is ours. Indeed, we are gathered here to ensure that this choice that is also ours and does not only belong to the head of states who will gather in New York in three weeks, won't be the lowest common denominator between competing short-sighted political agendas, but an ambitious, inclusive, and impactful roadmap for a better future for all. Unfortunately, I shall say that there are zero mentions in the whole pact for the future to ethics or values. It's more than 15, 20 pages of document. We only read about ethical usage of technology. And the word value is used once in its economic meaning. We tried, and we are still trying, to change this. If not in the text, probably too late now, at least in the mindset of the decision makers. The humanity is hunger not only for food, and peace, but also for hope. The hope for a brighter future that we owe to the young and future generations. Only ethical leadership can guide us towards hope. When we thought to organize the forum this year under the title, 
ethical leadership for a re-envisioned future, we decided to launch with the forum an award for ethical leadership. Because only leaders whose thoughts, decisions, and acts are ethically rooted can be the lighthouses we need to find the road for the future. However, after reflection, we transformed this initiative into a youth leadership award. Convinced that the ethical leadership we need, capable of making us dreaming and mobilizing for a brighter future, are the young people themselves. The Declaration on Future Generations, also to be adopted by the Summit of the Future, recognizes children and youth as agents of change, and we do. We will meet, hear, and celebrate three of those young leaders present among us as finalists for the first edition of the Youth Leadership Award. Hence, we want this forum to be a safe space for intergenerational, intercultural, and intersectoral engagement for solution-oriented thought leadership. It unfolds during three days of promising discussions and creative recommendations under three main thematic areas, inclusive peace and development, responsible governance, and trustworthy artificial intelligence. The collective thinking of 78 speakers and 32 knowledge partners from 34 countries and six continents gathered here with more than 1,000 on-site and online participants can be, can't be but groundbreaking engagement searching for creative answers for the following challenging questions. How can ethical and spiritual leaders contribute to reconciliation and life savings? How can we revive ethics in international relations? What kind of new paradigm is needed in philanthropy for sustainable development and peace? Is the ESG hype cycle over? And how the private sector can contribute to a sustainable and inclusive future? How to understand ethics and compliance, navigate their respective specificities and integrate their application for better responsible governance? Can the fourth industrial revolution serve human dignity and unity? How can the higher education institutions move from fighting back to guiding the responsible innovation generated by AI? And how can we foster intergenerational dialogue and action on ethics? The discussions will be framed by an opening dialogue on ethical leadership and the closing discussion on the 2050 visions. The forum will also include the launch of many publications and policy reports, such as, as the Global Survey on Business Ethics, and the report on navigating the future of higher education with artificial intelligence. After the intensive discussions, the forum will conclude with a festive moment, celebrating together the 20th anniversary of Globe Ethics and the presidency handover. Finally, I would like to say an immense gratitude to those who believed in this initiative and accepted to join us in diverse forums. Thank you, Martin, for being our guest speaker for this year bringing through you the voice of the world parliaments and also the wisdom of Africa, the continent of hope. Thanks also to Swiss and Brazilian ambassadors who had well uh, jo joined us uh, to express the G20 perspective and the uh, Switzerland perspective on the question of ethical leadership. Bienvenue, Madame la Présidente Ponton, and thank you also for having joined us in this opening session, we are also looking forward to hear your, your comments. A special thanks also to all the speakers and moderators, but also to the musicians, Sogol and Nic Nicolaus, whose performance is part of our expression of hope through the beauty and symphonic harmony of our different cultures. I would also like to thank our 32 knowledge partners. The list would be too long to cite them all, but the, the logos are here on the, on the screen from six different continents, from different sectors, and also our sponsors, Fondation Pierre et Laura Zurker, the city of Grand Saconé, and Kaji Centre d'Accueil de la Genève Internationale, and our strategic partners who substantially contributed to financing the forum, our long-standing partner, Lindsay Foundation and King Song Health Company. My speech comes to an end, and it's time to use my glass.
My speech comes to an end, but it's not the last word. But before leaving the stage, I want to give you two rendezvous. The first one on Wednesday afternoon to present the conclusions of the forum, which also will be published in a policy report that, that you will receive. And secondly, I give you another rendezvous next year for the following edition of Global Ethics Forum to continue our journey together because as the African proverb says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And definitely we want to go far. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Fatidaou, for this welcoming speech and words of hope. Ms. Dora Yang is a founder and president of Kinsong Health Group in China. She has played a big role in China's medical security system. Ms. Dora Yang is renowned as a trailblazer in the field of internet-based healthcare assurance, providing assistance to millions of families. I'm pleased to give now the floor to Ms. Dora Young. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good day to you all. As we are gathering here in Geneva, known for its openness and creatively, we find ourselves uh, at a timely moment in a world facing the challenges such as wars, humanitarian crisis, having conversation in a newer setting like this is more critical than ever. Qingzong House, as a company, decided to advance life and health. It's honored to support this forum. As one of strategic partner, promote global conversations and inclusive development. Today, as we talk about ethical leadership for peace, development, and trustworthy AI, I'd like to share some thoughts from our experience at Qingzong Health, focused on AI in healthcare. First, AI as a bridge builder. AI really shines when it comes to break down geographic bar barriers. In certain years, telemedical consultants has incre uh, increased by over 200% globally, making it possible for millions to access specialized medical care, special in the remote area. Think of this as a digital highway, connect everyone to the network of uh, uh, medical ex expertise. The digital highway helps tackle the tough realities that one in 10 people still lack in essential health service. Our AI tools, Dr. GBT is a great example for this able to handle questions about 3,800 common disease and provide cares for remote management to urgent needs. As a special uh, focus on, crack, uh, on chronic disease and rehabilitation, no matter where you are in the world, no matter which language you speak, our Dr. GBT is able to 24 seven to assist uh, those who need it. Secondly, AI in prevention, moving forward proactive care. There is, uh, there was a ancient uh, Chinese physician, Bian Chue, knows for his philosophy of treating disease before a cure. AI now helps it make uh, help make this reality. Study indicate that early 
uh, intervention strategies powered by AI can cut healthcare costs by up to 30% and significantly enhance the patient well being. Our innovative health de uh, detector combines Asian wisdom and advanced infrared tech, uh, technology to identify disease risk and offer personalized health advice tailored to individual needs. This, this blend of traditional and technology shows our commitment to proactive wellness. Lastly, ethical AI, keeping innovation human-centered. In today's technology-driven world, it's crucial to keep ethics in mind, guided by the Con uh, Confucian's value about benevolence and uh, MC, Qingzong House, along with other global leaders, is decided to creating AI that respect human dignity, privacy, and improve the quality of the life. International guidelines like the OECD AI principle strains the needs for uh, transparency accountability and fairness in AI development. This highlights uh, worldwide agreement in important ethical AI. We are deeply grateful for the uh, for global things and uh, we are lucky to collaborate with them to promote the ethical use uh, to the AI technology support sustainable and inclusive development. Thanks. Let's keep it this inspiring conference going, inspired by a Geneva spirit of inclusive, Qingzong Health is committed to ethical innovation and uh, uh, global think leadership in policy dialogue. Today, we are paving the way for brighter, healthier future for all. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you, Ms. Dora Young. Ambassador Julian Tony is representative to the Conference on Disarmament of the Permanent Mission of Switzerland to the United Nations Office and other international organizations in Geneva. Please, Mr. Ambassador, your speech. <laughs> Madame la Présidente du Conseil d'État, Excellence, Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor and also a pleasure to address you today as a representative of Switzerland to share thoughts on the fundamental theme of multilateralism, ethical leadership in the face of the great challenges of our time. This discussion is particularly timely, just two weeks ahead of the summit of the future, which was mentioned by you. Ethical leadership will be essential in ensuring that commitments made at the summit translate into concrete actions. In my understanding, ethical leadership is about decision making and actions that transcend narrow individual interest to promote the common good. It addresses shared global goals that benefit all of humanity and balances short term needs with long term goals, offering future generations a sustainable and equitable future. Geneva is the ideal setting for this discussion. Not only it is a crossroad of global diplomacy, but it is also a city where ethical leadership has shaped international norms and institutions for over a century, making Geneva a center of international governance. In 1863, the Red Cross movement was founded here, laying the groundwork for, for an ethical commitment to protecting human life and dignity in times of conflict. In response to the calamities of the two world wars and then the changing nature of conflicts, 
nations have sought solutions through a reinforced multilateralism using dialogue and cooperation. This led to the creation of numerous international organizations, now 43 in Geneva, and the development of norms that continue to guide our actions today. The objectives of these organizations and norms, deeply ethical, include the peaceful resolution of conflicts, the promotion of disarmament, the defense of fundamental rights and sustainable development, the protection of the environment, as well as economic and scientific cooperation. And scientific cooperation also for peace, of course. For instance, the International Labour Organization established in 1919 was founded on the conviction that lasting peace must rest on social justice. These advances are rooted in rich dialogues anchored in diverse religious, philosophical, cultural, and also legal traditions. They are the result of a constant dialectic between defending national interest and upholding universal human values. Today, facing unprecedented challenges such as the climate crisis, rapid technological developments, and increased polarization in international relations, it sometimes seems the world is drifting away from basic ethical principle. It is evidenced by the brutality of current conflicts and the disregard for the Geneva Conventions in Ukraine, Sudan, Yemen, Gaza, to quote only a few examples. Geneva, with its central role in promoting international dialogue, is and will remain essential for addressing global challenges guided by an ethical compass grounded in international law. Maintaining this compass is not optional. It is a legal and moral obligation enshrined in the United Nations Charter, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Geneva Convention, and other important treaties. Let me illustrate with a few examples where Switzerland has a staunch defender of multilateralism sees a space for ethical leadership in and from Geneva. First, in peace, enhancing efforts to prevent conflict and sustain peace, combining local, national, and multilateral efforts, as proposed by the new agenda for peace of the United Nations Secretary General. A more resolute focus on preventing conflict through a comprehensive approach addressing their underlying drivers and exercising mediation, dialogue, and diplomacy is required. Second, in disarmament, regulating autonomous weapon system to ensure compliance with international humanitarian law and banning those that do not comply. The second meeting of the group of governmental experts on those weapons laws took place last week in the Palais des Nations. In humanitarian efforts, prioritizing the protection of humanitarian personnel in armed conflicts, following up on Switzerland's resolution at the Security Council this year but also welcoming two meetings dedicated to the conflict in Sudan on humanitarian access and ceasefire, respectively in July and August of this year. Third, fourthly, in technology, using Geneva as a global hub for digital governance with initiatives like the GIGA project to connect every school worldwide to the internet, bridging the gap for over 1 billion children. Fifth, in human rights, supporting efforts to ban the death penalty and address associated human rights violation, as reflected in Switzerland 2023 Human Rights Council resolution. And six, in, 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 in environment, peace and security in the broadest sense, collaborating to ensure the equitable and sustainable use of shared water resources as water is the source of life. In conclusion, I would like to again underline that ethical leadership requests continuous reflection and sometimes difficult decision to preserve the integrity and credibility of foreign policy in a rapidly changing world. It will continue to play a central role in guiding political processes and ensuring that commitments lead to tangible and measurable actions. I'm confident that our discussion at the forum will advance this reflection and mobilize action-oriented partnership. I look forward to learning about the outcomes of the forum. Thank you for your attention, and I wish us fruitful and enriching discussion. Thank you, Ambassador Giulantoni. Ambassador Tova da Silva Nunez, is permanent representative of Brazil in Cuban G20 presidency to the United Nations office and other 
International Organization in Geneva. Mr. Ambassador, <laughs> you will share with us your perspective on the ethical leadership. Thank you very much, Madam President of the Council of the Republican Canton of Geneva. My dear friend, Martin Chungong, Secretary General of the IPU, Excellencies, dear friends, allow me to greet and salute all speakers through you, Martin, as guest speaker. It's an honor for us to be here today. And before I start my former speech, allow me to say how uh, rewarding and inspiring it was to begin with the music interlude, the music moment. It reminds me of my time in India as ambassador, my first post, where every meeting was preceded by the invocation of forces of energy, of light. And I think that to discuss ethical leadership, we need more than words. We need more than actually um, what we usually have in our multilateral meetings. We need engagement, we need decision-making, but we also need a lot more energy than the usual lot of instructions that we receive from our capitals. So thank you very much for allowing us to, us to have that kind of inspiration. Uh, I also want to uh, acknowledge the very inspiring words of Professor Fadi Daou for uh, also a little message on negotiators of the uh, Pact of the Future. Uh, it did not go unnoticed and uh, we still have to do a lot more to incorporate uh, issues related to ethics and values. And I think that although we keep uh, repeating the word values, and then we sometimes fail to put that into our commitments and to our normatization exercise. As I said, it's a, an honor for us to re be representing Brazil as head of the G20, because I think that the subject theme of the um, forum uh, fits perfectly into what Brazil has chosen as a motto for our uh, G20 presidency. Our slogan is building a just world and a sustainable planet. And that reflects our commitments to these values of justice, but also social justice that is contained into sustainable development. And we have set as our um, priorities three. First one is social inclusion and combating hunger and poverty. I don't think anybody here can claim that we are going to be ethical while people go hungry and in poverty. Energy transitions and promoting sustainable development. Again, sustainable development presupposes three different axes and uh, it's not only about um, environment but also social and economic issues. And so uh, this again, is laden with values and ethical considerations. And finally, reforming global government institutions, because we claim that the way the world is organized nowadays is not conducive to more ethical leadership or to more results, especially in combating social inequalities or the lack of access to resources and solutions. So this is, these are the three priorities that Brazil has chosen as our priorities for the G. 20, we are particularly happy to see uh, or to have a G20 at a time where it has expanded to include the African Union. This is not a minor detail of a history of the G20, so that we see G20 being a lot more than only the 20 um, economies that are, were in, in the past leading the world. Uh, we are actually opening space to welcome more nations, and we are particularly happy that under President Lula's leadership, we are now incorporating the whole of the African unit in our deliberations. Now, global inequality is widening at an alarming rate. And as we move uh, further to achieve key goals, particularly SG1, SG1 is poverty eradication. So we have to make sure that we do not fail on the very first sustainable development goal that we have already created. See, sometimes it's not about changing the commitments, not changing the agenda to just abide by them, comply with our commitments. That's the first rule that we see that goes also for issues like international humanitarian law, for example, it suffices to abide by the Geneva Conventions. They are very well, they're going very well, thank you, in this after 75 years, 
but we need to commit to them or recommit. SDG2 is here zero hunger. Again, one uh, very dear issue to us and a very important uh, task for us to conduct. Now, both hunger and poverty remain persistent challenges that not only hinder development, but also have far reaching repercussions, for example, on climate change. So one is the cause of the other as well. And then the management of climate change does uh, require addressing hunger and poverty. Public health, we've tried to uh, reach an agreement on a pandemic agreement, and we will not reach any ethically acceptable agreement if we do not um, grant unhindered, timely, affordable access to medical countermeasures, be them therapeutics, diagnostics, or vaccines. And we're also facing an intergenerational inequality. So this is something that also should uh, kept our attention. Now, Brazil is proposing to establish in the summit of the G20 in November, what we call a global alliance against hunger and poverty. Again, going to, be to basics, SDG one and two. This initiative aims to revolutionize our approach by leveraging innovation, fostering collaboration and supporting country-led implementation of policies targeting the most vulnerable. It seems obvious, but it has not been the priority to tackle the issues that are reaching the most vulnerable. It seeks to accelerate progress toward the SDGs and build a more actable world. Now, this alliance will welcome voluntary participation through tailored statements of commitments from countries, international organizations, development banks, and others, and other actors. Its official launch is planned, as I said, for the G20 Leaders Summit in November in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Now, the strengthening of financing for energy transition and sustainable development is one, again, one of the topics that Brazil intends to prioritize, not only in G20, but also in other multilateral fora, such as the COP30, which will be hosted in Belém do Pará in 2025, in the very heart of the Amazon region. We invite all nations to fully engage in what is called the Mission 1.5 degrees Celsius initiative, which seeks to unite the international community around the goal of the Paris Agreement, striving to keep the global temperature increased increase below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Now the world is at a pivotal moment. The challenges we face that range from geopolitical tensions to climate change demand a renewed commitment to multilateralism. And we are at the capital of multilateralism before any other city of the UN system. We believe peace, stability and development require a re revitalized multilateral system. And for that, we must strengthen our adherence to the UN charter international law, international humanitarian law, and diplomacy. It is high time for the G20 to contribute meaningfully to reforming global governance. And to this end, we are convening in New York on um, September 25th, G20 foreign ministers to open, which is, will be open for the very first time to all UN members. So you won't only be foreign ministers from the G20, but we're inviting 12, organizations, but also uh, it's going to take place at the ECOSOC building in order to allow broad participation for all memberships. Why? This is necessary for us because of two key reasons. First, it will take place within the UN headquarters in New York, sending a message that it is time for multilateralism to take stance on um, inequality. And um, it also symbolizes our unwavering belief that the UN must remain at the heart of the multilateral system. There's no alternative possible or viable. The second reason is for the first time in, in the history of the G20, that all members will be invited, which will reflect then our commitment to inclusivity and global dialogue. Again, we're, it's not our intention to keep the G20 uh, an exclusive club, rather the opposite, allow it to work towards various direction in, in our planet as a whole. Now, Geneva highlights the importance of inclusivity in global governance. Here, we work closely with civil society to ensure broad-based support for our initiatives and institutionalizing social participation is for us vital for a fairer, more sustainable world. We are actually trying to seek uh, more participation, for example, 
by indigenous uh, peoples in human rights. This is one example. We're trying to bring more and more participation of voices that have not been heard sufficiently enough in Geneva. Issues like gender equality, social inclusion, and sustainable development can benefit greatly from civil society engagement. Now, Brazil's administration has reinforced support for civil society in our foreign policy. We have held, for example, what we call the Amazon Dialogues, the Mercosul Social Summit, and the D20 engagement groups. I'm saying this because there is place for non-state actors. This is not something that states alone will tackle, you know, inequality. Um, and then again, this commitment is highlighted in the G20 uh, Social Summit, uh, where civil society will play a key role in shaping the global agenda. So I try to share with you our um, priorities, our program, and allow me to finish with the words by our president that says that the future will hinge on our capacity to overcome historical inequalities and injustice, enabling us to prevail over the current challenges faced by humankind. I thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Tovar da Silva Nunez. And now we are pleased to give the floor to the President of the Council of State of the Republic and Canton of Geneva, Ms. Nathalie Fontanet. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, as we gather here today, we are reminded of the crucial role that Geneva plays in promoting a better future for all through global cooperation. For more than 160 years, Geneva has offered its hospitality, infrastructures, intellectual resources, and neutrality to support the mission of global players, contributing to a safer, and more just, more prosperous and sustainable world. These players are more than 60, 180, 680, sorry, 680 international organizations, NGOs and permanent missions nowadays. They have never been so numerous. Geneva is proud to host them. I'm pleased to see several of them in the program of your forum. This shows the appetite of the international Geneva community for serious discussions about ethics. Our answers to global challenges cannot be purely technical or dryly scientific. A moral component is obviously indispensable. A clear moral compass to guide our decisions is needed by all of us and every day. In today's turbulent times, communities from north to south and east to west do not live side by side, but together on the same planet and increasingly with common challenges. In this context, intercultural dialogue plays a crucial role by engaging in meaningful conversations with individuals from different backgrounds and perspectives we can break down barriers, foster mutual respect, improve mutual understanding, and hopefully discover common values. Actually, I'm profoundly convinced that when it comes to issues like peace, rights, on, rights or health, all human beings share similar values. International humanitarian law is a good example in this respect. We are commemorating this year the 75th anniversary of the four Geneva Conventions. These texts are universally ratified since 2013. They enshrine values of care and respect for those who do not participate or do not participate anymore in hostilities. These values have existed for a long time before being codified in international treaties. And these values 
can be found in ancestral cultures and traditions all over the world. In conclusion, let us remember that the future of our world is in our hands, and it is up to us as responsible leaders and global citizens to work together towards a more ethical and sustainable future for all. The state, the state of Geneva is glad to have modestly contributed through the International, Welcome, International Geneva Welcome Set Center to your gathering. I sincerely wish you every success and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Nathalie Fontenay. We are going to discuss all these issues in a few minutes with a panel of experts. Uh, to conclude this part, this first part of the Global Ethic Forum, I am pleased to hand over to the Secretary General of Interparliamentary Union. Please, Mr. Martin Chungong. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Director of Ceremonies. Um, Your Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I believe uh, previous speakers have already addressed uh, protocolar matters, and so I will just acknowledge the presence of all those dignitaries and all the participants here today. I have been given the honor to deliver the keynote address at this year's Global Ethics Forum. And I feel very humbled by this privilege. When I look at the title of uh, this year's uh, uh, forum, I could say it could not have been more appropriate. We are seeking to address ethical leadership in a re-envisioned future. I salute those who designed this program because many of us global leaders tend to behave like there was no future. And we are seen to be ineffective in delivering on the challenges facing the global community today. And you will all agree with me, I believe the designers of the program have uh, adequately explain that there is no paucity of challenges facing the global community today. We have conflicts raging around the world. We have the, we have the emergence of new technologies, uh, including AI, is at once a source of hope and a source of concern for many of us because it is fraught with a lot of uh, uncertainties. So uh, I believe in the minds of the framers of this meeting, they wanted us to re-envision a different world from what we know it today. And that world would require a new way of thinking so that some of those mechanisms that we have in place today cannot be called into question. I have no doubt that multilateralism will continue to be at the forefront of the global response to the challenges facing us. So it's not a question of saying you do away with multilateralism. That would uh, be like throwing the bath water with the baby. We need to see how we can reframe multilateralism so that it can be more effective, it can be more legitimate, and in this way, be more relevant to the needs of the people. In fact, when the United Nations was created what, some, in 1945, uh, the reality was, of course, the same. You had conflict. We needed to resolve conflict. But you had some stakeholders who were limited in number. But today, we do have the emergence of many other stakeholders, which I think should be included in our multilateral uh, mechanisms uh, today. So 
I speak to you today in my capacity as Secretary General of the Interparliamentary Union, the global organization of uh, parliaments across the world, some 180 of them. And so you, the uh, experience that I'll be sharing with you will be reflective of what I have seen over the years as head of this organization in terms of uh, the position of parliaments and uh, parliamentarians. So for me, I think that leadership, including ethical leadership, goes to the very mandate of parliamentarians and parliaments. Parliamentarians are the representatives of the people, and they have to have the moral weight to represent the people and deliver on their expectations. And that is what we at the Interparliamentary Union are trying to do, identify what it is that parliaments need to do, what parliamentarians need to do, but also strengthening their capacity to do just that. Because we cannot assume that parliaments will display those skills and capacity that are required to deliver on the mandate entrusted to them by the people. So we try to promote dialogue. It is important that we no longer see parliaments and parliamentarians living in a bubble or ivory tower, oblivious of what is happening around them. So that is one thing I would like to share with you in terms of ethical leadership. Ethical leadership should be one that is uh, promoting dialogue, promoting conversations between leaders, political leaders, and other uh, leaders across a society with a view to inclusive and legitimate uh, outcomes. And I must say that we're pleased that uh, the values articulated by Globe Ethics, thank you, uh, Christophe and uh, uh, Fadi for inviting me, the moral values that you uh, articulate are very much aligned with those that the IPU is promoting. When we talk of inclusivity, equality, respect, integrity, and solidarity, these are all, I think, qualities that we need to display as uh, leaders uh, today. And that is why at the Interparliamentary Union, we have developed the ecosystem approach which means that we no longer see parliaments or parliamentarians as a self-contained institution, oblivious of what is happening around them. They have to reach out to all of society if they want to reflect the views of all of society. They have to reach out to experts, civil society, professionals, academicians, all people who can contribute to enriching decision-making. So inclusivity of approach integration of approach is something that we think is inherent in ethical, and I hasten to say, more effective uh, leadership. So I see that this forum, and I'm very happy this year, is casting a broad net, addressing peace, sustainability, responsible governance, and the digital revolution with a focus on intercultural and intergenerational dialogue. We could question the rationale of this approach when we look at what the world is going through and the victims of uh, the challenges that we are looking uh, at in the world uh, today. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think that parliamentarians, their primary duty is to represent citizens. It is not to sit in a room. That does not mean they have just to come and sit in a room and say they are representatives of the people. They have to think and act on behalf of the people. They have to take decisions that make a positive impact on the lives of the people. A lot has been said about democracy, strong parliaments around the world, but these are at best abstract notions. They only have a meaning if democracy, human rights, the rule of law, all translate 
into better well-being for the people. And so this is something that I believe parliamentarians should be articulating. That is the meaning of representation, representation of the people. And I think that ethical leadership must address the issue of trust. Our global community is facing a breach of trust. There is a disconnect between governors and the governed because the governors are not being seen as being able to address the concerns of the people. We look at our global institutions, our multilateral institutions, they're not trusted anymore because in spite of the existence of the IPU, the United Nations, the war is raging in Gaza. Uh, the war is raging in Ukraine. Uh, we are yet to find solutions to this, which therefore means that we have to step up, step up the game. And I hasten to say, I think a previous speaker mentioned it, it's not that we lack the mechanisms. The mechanisms are there. We need just to rededicate ourselves to uh, implementing uh, those mechanisms with a lot of uh, devotion. So I am the first to acknowledge that parliamentarians are not in the good books of society. And I think you made that point, uh, Fadi, last year when we met in Marrakesh, that politicians, when you look at the ladder of public confidence, politicians are the, at the bottom, including parliamentarians. I agree with you entirely because they're not seen to be serving the interests of the people. They are self-serving. They consider leadership as a right and not a privilege to serve humanity. So I think that it is important for us to be mindful of this a very important uh, aspect. And for us to restore trust, for us to restore the legitimacy of leaders, including parliamentary leaders, we need to go back to what we mean by democracy. We, for us, democracy means the existence of strong parliaments. And strong parliaments need to be representative of society. They need to be transparent in the way they operate. They need to be accountable to the people. You, just, you don't go and see the people just when you have to be elected and you forget them. You have to be accessible. Parliamentarians need to be accessible to the people and they have to be effective on delivering. These are things that I think we all share and which I think we can prosecute in a more, uh, uh, I would say, stringent uh, manner. I made reference to um, science and technology, including innovation. I said that this area is emerging strongly and fraught with a lot of concern because AI, for instance, has the potential to move on into a much better future, but it also holds the potential to annihilate humanity. It is therefore important that effective leaders, effective or ethical leaders should address the issue of artificial intelligence identifying those potentials that are positive in their outcome, and also seeking to address the concerns, to address the doubts uh, and the positive negative effect of artificial intelligence. And that is what we at the Interparliamentary Union are doing, looking at how uh, official, artificial intelligence can impact uh, uh, democracy but also we want to see how we can establish linkages between the world of policy making, the world of politics and the scientific community. And that is why uh, the experience of JESDA here based in Geneva is so, uh, resonates so well with us because it is important that in our era of ethical leadership, political leaders must be taking decisions on the basis of clear scientific evidence and not just on, uh, I would say, uh, speculation. So I encourage us and the global community to engage more with the uh, scientific uh, 
uh, community. In the ITU, I think this will resonate very well with you, Fadil and Christophe. We are actually in the process of adopting a charter of ethics in science and technological innovation. We want parliaments to be at the forefront of the global community in terms of harnessing the positive potential of scientific and technological innovation. And so later this year, we'll be coming up with this document that would be guidelines for how parliaments can address the various challenges that come with scientific and technological innovation. Um, I believe previous speakers have talked about inclusiveness in terms of including different stakeholders in the policymaking uh, context. And a lot has been said about gender equality. A lot has been said about intergenerational dialogue, involvement of young people. And if I may, for a few seconds, put on my hat as uh, chair of the Global Board of International Gender Champions, I want to say how important professionally and personally for me gender equality is. You cannot have effective, you cannot have ethical leadership without the equitable participation of both men and women in decision-making processes. That is not currently the case. Our data shows that women account for just 27% of parliamentary membership. That's not enough. Why shouldn't we have 50% of women parliamentarians and 50% men parliamentarians? Because that is the relative uh, ratio of uh, parliamentarians or society in general. So we want to fight uh, for more gender equality. And in this particular aspect, it is not only in terms of numbers, women should be able to be given positions where they can make a difference in decision-making. And talking about gender equality, we need also to address those concerns or those challenges facing women who go into politics. We do see, and the data is out there across the world, that women politicians are more likely to be victims of gender-based violence on account of their involvement in politics than men. And so we need to address this head on. It's not, I think, a good thing for women to be victimized on account of political ambition. And I would like to say the same thing for young generations. We travel, I, I was in Salzburg a few days ago and we we're talking about the future of Europe in an uncertain world, reinvention world. And one of the things that we're keen to point out was that it's no longer on to say that young people are the leaders of tomorrow. They are the leaders of today. They have to contribute to decisions that will govern society over uh, future generations. And so we don't have to wait for them to be leaders in order to take those decisions. And so for us, it's very important and when you look at the global statistics, you have society in general that has 60% made up of people under 30 years of age. Do you know what percentage of that age bracket is represented in parliament? It's appalling, under 3%. Less than 3% of young people are represented. Young people under the age of 30 are represented in those institutions that are supposed to be making decisions and policies that govern their future. So we have come up with this campaign uh, called, I say, yes to more youth in parliament and leaders across the world, including heads of state are signing up to this uh, campaign in order to bring more young people in the mainstream of uh, policy uh, making a decision. Let me use this opportunity to uh, say a few words about our partners, uh, Globe Ethics. Thank you uh, for uh, reaching out to us to be knowledge partners in this uh, forum. Uh, we are also pleased to uh, count you among our knowledge partners, and we did appreciate, uh, Fadi, your interventions last year during 
the first ever parliamentary conference on interfaith dialogue, which took place in Marrakesh. And again, I think this speaks to the need to reach out to multiple stakeholders. People may say politicians and religious leaders <clears throat> coming together constitute an, an unholy alliance, but that's not true. They have mandates that overlap. They have mandates that resonate very well with uh, society. So I was very pleased that you could participate, Fadi, in this uh, event. And uh, we were pleased that uh, the dialogue that took place between parliamentary leaders and religious scholars and others, senior, was very fruitful to the extent that today there are calls for more uh, such encounters. And we are set in the context of uh, the Catholic Church Jubilee next year to organize a major conference in follow-up to Marrakesh at the Vatican this time. So we think that inclusiveness is the name of the game. So we cannot have uh, any leadership that is exclusive or divisive. I would like to conclude because I think we are running out of time, but just to offer a few thoughts about ethical leadership. First of all, I think an ethical leader should be listening, not just hearing. Ethical leaders must listen, which means that they should dedicate themselves to understanding the concerns of their interlocutors instead of just using their ears. That's one thing, which leads me to the fact that ethical leadership has to be compassionate, it has to be equitable. And I think it's Madame Fontenet who said that we cannot limit ourselves to those technical solutions. They have to be equitable, they have to be fair uh, to the people. Also, ethical leaders need to see and not just look. We need to see who the personality is behind Ambassador uh, Da Silva, who, which personality is behind Christoph and anybody else here, rather than just their physical appearance and factor this into their decision. Ethical leadership requires that politicians and others speak out against injustice and speak up for the marginalized. The marginalized are a category that we have to pay attention to. And I would like to say that ethical leadership is steeped in the common interest. I think that point has been made by all the previous speakers over and above individual parochial interests. The moral compass has to be clearly re-established, which means that politicians and other leaders must take decisions in the common interest and not be selfish or egoistic in their approach. This means that ethical leadership should be transparent, it should be accountable, it should fight morally reprehensible uh, actions such as corruption. This is something that I think is important. Eth <clears throat> ethical leadership has no place for populism, for hate speech, for divisive speech. Ethical leadership should be rallying, should be rallying all of society to tackle the uh, problems and challenges facing all of society. And lastly, ethical leadership should be people-centered, which means that as a leader, we should always ask the question, in what way are my decisions or actions beneficial or negative to the interests of the people? If we cannot have clear-cut answers to this question, then we are required to think twice. So I will just conclude with uh, those uh, words to say that this world, it is not uh, 
a question of lack or shortage of moral values and principles. <coughs> what we need to do in the context of efficient or ethical leadership is to rise to those values and principles that are universally recognized, human rights, rule of law, equity, equality, and all of that we have them. And so for me, ethical leadership is just that. We need to step up the game. Otherwise, we will not be deserving of the trust that the people have entrusted to our leaders, such as ourselves, parliamentarians, and those sitting in this room. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Martin Chubon. Before uh, calling our expert to the panel, we have the pleasure of hearing uh, Solongo Mirzai's music again, this time with Nikolaus Dimitriadis, a Greek scholar and uh, musician, founder of the Smile World Tour, a project about love and respect for creation, human, and nature. Please. Uh, hello to all of you, distinguished guests. I met uh, Sogol just 78 minutes ago. <laughs> we didn't rehearse at all, but this, I think, is a lesson to all of us. Thank you very much for, I think, today, for me, it's a triple celebration. First, before we go, because I'm here after 20 years. Then I celebrate my friendship with Christophe, I know him from 20 years. And uh, what we're going to experience today, it's a dialogue which is more than music. The dialogue between East and West, it's about fostering a deeper understanding and respect between cultures. And at least will ensure that our global community grows not just in knowledge, but uh, in empathy and in ethical consciousness. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you.